All right, Sagar, what are you looking at? Well, it may not seem like it sometimes, but the magnitude of cultural change in this country as a result of the internet is really difficult to describe. When I read books about the period of the 1950s all the way to the early 2000s, the ubiquitous thing that they always describe, the power of TV. A history of the American presidency post-Truman is inextricable from television. We all know the story of the JFK-Nixon debate, but when you dig deeper, the real magnitude of TV actually comes when it shapes the future of politicians who take power later. Take Reagan, for example. Yeah, Reagan was a movie star in the 1940s. What really put him on the map as a political figure was his GE television hour in the 1950s when he extolled the virtues of capitalism and aligned himself with the political right. He took that stardom, combined it with advocacy for a cause, and it launched him into the governor's chair in California and then the American presidency. Take Bill Clinton. Clinton was a literal nobody from Arkansas. He actually gave a panned speech at the 1988 DNC convention, nominating Dukakis back when those things apparently mattered. But he was a national joke. But he saved himself and his political career by going on late night with Johnny Carson. Hmm. When he was running for president, he was actually, it was televised press conferences and his appearances, like programs like Arsenio Hall, which is what put him forward, eventually won him the presidency. Barack Obama, of course. Obama may have used the internet to propel him to the Oval Office in 2008, but he owes all of his fame to television. His speech at the 2004 DNC convention about there being no white and black America was a blockbuster. Not only millions of people watched it, it was played over and over again on cable TV. He wrote a book and was interviewed on Late Night. How else do you go from a state senator in Illinois to president of the United States in four years? TV could also be a career killer. It was for George H.W. Bush. He checked his watch at the debate for Dan, with, uh, with, with Bill Clinton. Or Dan Quayle, not knowing how to spell potato. <laughs> I could give a million examples, but I think my point is being made. American politics, and really our whole culture, it was ruled by TV. Until suddenly, it, it just isn't anymore. Trump may have gotten himself famous through TV, but it was the internet that elected him. Not only through his gargantuan fundraising, but for the first time, flipping the script forcing TV to cover his musings on Twitter. That flip of power was the first of its kind in American politics. And while 2020 was a much more normal type of election because of the COVID pandemic, my prediction is that the power of TV will diminish less and less and less every cycle from here on out. And I absolutely welcome it. We dunk a lot on cable news ratings and the decline in the medium. But when you look at the data on all of television, it's stunning to behold. Consider this. Trevor Noah recently departed the scene, supposedly voluntarily. Whether that's true or not, a 38-year-old comedian in the supposed prime of his life departing a primetime TV show even a decade ago would have been unheard of. Even if you don't like Trevor Noah, can you really deny he's not going to be better off on the internet and touring around the world? The numbers bear it out. Noah presided over the loss of a million viewers in a night in the seven years that he headed The Daily Show. And look, I do not like Trevor Noah. He certainly had some agency in this. But the truth is, it's probably more a commentary on the decline of TV itself. Jon Stewart was garnering 1.3 million total viewers on the day he left, compared with the 372,000 for Trevor Noah on the day he said he would leave. Noah's departure in the same year. Conan O'Brien is out, James Corden, Samantha Bee too. On broadcast, crazy things are happening. I personally think almost all Fox programming is cringe, but a lot of people took notice when Fox News' 11 p.m. slot featuring Greg Gutfeld beat out Stephen Colbert with a total audience of 2.355 million people compared to Colbert's 2 million. Both of those make a guy like Jimmy Kimmel look like a joke. He only gets a million. When you consider younger viewers through all of them, though, they look even more ridiculous. None of them even crack 400,000 in the key demo. Ten years ago, those numbers were orders of magnitude larger. And ten years before that, even bigger than that. They were juggernauts, genuine titans who ruled American culture and our politics. Today, if a politician goes on Jimmy Kimmel, does anyone care? <laughs> on cable, of course, the people I consider are true enemies. We've talked about it endlessly. But the recent management of Alex Wagner over at MSNBC and her replacement of Maddow portends the exact same thing. Wagner's debut, by nearly all metrics, has been a colossal failure. She routinely is able to average only 150,000 viewers in the key demographic. Furthermore, she is not even doing well by cable's own standards. Data currently shows that thousands of people are actually turning the TV off when she comes on at 9 and then turning it back on at 10, meaning they would rather watch Chris Hayes and Lawrence O'Donnell and have no interest in her. 
Management, for their part, has no response. As Dylan Byers of Puck News wrote, quote, MSNBC is just trying to manage the decline of the linear business. Manage decline is an acknowledgement that the writing is on the wall. And as I've said many times, the real death knell to TV will not come from viewers. It will come from the cable companies themselves, who pay billions of dollars to the three networks to keep them as part of their bundle. Now, it's what makes Fox News, CNN, and MSNBC all make a collective profit just last year of more than $3 billion, despite losing a historic amount of viewers. The cable companies pay them a lot of money because they have a monopoly right now on live events, like when an explosion happens and when people want to tune in. But this too is dying because of the internet. Ask yourself this question on Ukraine. Do you really need that CNN guy there on the ground? Or is a bunch of dudes on the ground posting on Telegram and on Twitter? Is that enough? It's obviously the latter. Live news and live sports are the last bastions of TV. They too are dying. In fact, the latest ground on sports was broken just this month. Amazon Prime's new deal for Thursday Night Football drew in 13 million viewers, more than the NFL Network brought in the previous week. My prediction 10 years from now, CNN and the cable news networks will be making around half as much money. In 20 years, they'll be making half of that. But with approximately 50% or so of the budget, eventually it's going to be like Radio Shack, selling their prestige and brand to other companies for pennies on the dollar because they simply have no reason to exist anymore. All the writing is on the wall. It's just going to take some time. And that's one of the frustrating things. It's like, I wish it would all just... Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.